The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. This is Lawfare intern Ajay Sarma with a podcast from the Lawfare Archives for August 1st, 2021. Earlier this week, the Department of Justice authorized a number of Trump administration Justice Department officials, including former Acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen, to testify before Congress regarding former President Trump's efforts to use the Justice Department to invalidate the results of the 2020 presidential election. In doing so, the Biden administration essentially refused to exercise executive privilege to protect communication between the previous president and the Justice Department. For today's episode from the archives, I went back to August 2019, when then Lawfare Senior Editor Margaret Taylor sat down with Mark Rosell, the Dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, and author of Executive Privilege, Presidential Power, Secrecy, and Accountability. Rosell explains what executive privilege is, its implications for the separation of powers in the United States, and how the Trump administration differed from previous administrations in its response to congressional requests for information. Lawfare listeners will be able to better understand the Trump administration's invocations of executive privilege, which is critical to understanding why information that had been kept from Congress may now come to light. I'm Jacob Schultz, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 6th, 2019. Margaret Taylor sat down with Mark Rosell, the Dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, and the author of Executive Privilege, Presidential Power, Secrecy, and Accountability. His book chronicles the history of the constitutional doctrine of executive privilege in its many forms since the founding of the United States. They talked about what executive privilege is exactly, and the different ways presidents have asserted it over the years, and the diverse language presidents have used to describe the withholding of information from Congress. They talked about what is new in the Trump administration's handling of congressional demands for information and what it all means for the separation of powers in our constitutional democracy. It's the Lawfare Podcast, Episode 441, Mark Rosell on Presidential Power, Secrecy, and Accountability. So, Mark, why don't you walk us through some of the basics of what is executive privilege? Uh, how does it work sort of in, in conjunction with the subpoena power, for example, from Congress? Executive privilege is a constitutional-based power that belongs to the presidents that's uh, been widely recognized in constitutional law. And it is the right of the president and high executive branch officials to withhold information from those who have compulsory power special prosecutors, independent counsel, Congress in particular. It is the presumed right of the president to be able to withhold information, whether it's internal documents in the White House, testimony by White House staff, for example, for the purpose of protecting the broader national interest. A key point is that executive privilege does not exist in order to protect the president personally from revealing embarrassing information coming out of his administration. It does not exist to protect the president against politically inconvenient information coming out. It is there to serve the broader public interest. So most often, presidents have asserted, for example, national security concerns as a valid purpose for withholding information that has been requested from an administration. Now, there is no specific mention of executive privilege in the United States Constitution. That phrase was not a common, was not a part of our common language back then, but there is substantial historical precedent for the exercise of this presidential power going all the way back to the George Washington administration. So I have argued that all presidents have exercised some form of executive privilege, even though that language has not always been used. So let's talk about the founding fathers. Uh, obviously, the word executive privilege, as you said, is not in the Constitution. It's not a phrase they would have used. How did the founding fathers think about this idea of, you know, the idea of executive privilege? How, how would they have, you know, weighed 
these requests coming from the Congress. Right. So because the Constitution is largely silent on the matter, presidents have had to infer that there is a right of secrecy under Article II powers of the president. Uh, It is widely assumed as a commonsensical notion that presidents have occasional secrecy needs. I don't think that there has been any opposition at all to that general idea that there are times when secrecy serves the national interest and therefore information cannot immediately be made public. So George Washington confronted first, as is the case uh, by necessity, right? Uh, An instance in which the question came up regarding whether uh, a president has a right to withhold information from Congress when the president believes that there may be some compelling broader interest in doing so. He convened members of his cabinet, had a discussion about whether this is really a legitimate basis for uh, the president to deny information. He ultimately decided to turn the requested information to Congress. But the key point is that the president had convened his cabinet for the purpose of having a discussion whether the president indeed has his power at all to refuse a congressional request for information or testimony. And the president concluded that indeed he has the right to do so, although he decided in this particular case to turn the information over uh, to Congress. And so, I mean, James Madison said in Federalist 51 that in a Republican form of government, the legislation necessarily predominates. Do you do you think in the context of executive privilege, do you think Madison, you know, did he take the view that you know, how did he apply that that notion to this idea of the the president holding back information from Congress? So the the statement that the legislative necessarily predominates reflects the view of our chief constitutional architect that uh, in our representative form of democracy, the legislature holds the predominant amount of authority that's uh, vested in it in the Constitution. Uh, the language of Article I, of course, is very specific, 17 separate powers specifically uh, given to the legislative branch. Article II, rather vague in its descriptions of the powers of the executive. But this idea very much reflected the notion that presidential powers should be constrained by the system of separated powers, that presidents are not vested with unlimited authority to do whatever they want to do, and that the legislative branch as Article I, first in the Constitution, with most of the most significant powers of our national government listed there, in effect is the predominant uh, branch in our system of separated powers. That's not to say that Congress is always supreme to the executive, but for example, in the case of a power such as executive privilege, president claims he has a right to withhold information from Congress. The presumption in our system is in favor of openness, transparency, and is in favor of Congress's right to investigate the executive branch and get access to information. The president has to make the claim more firmly that he has a right to withhold information. So again, in the balancing test, the presumption is is in favor of openness, um, in favor of Congress's right to information, and the president has to prove that Indeed, he has significant reasons for withholding information that trumps Congress's uh, claim to access. I want to come back to that a little bit later mm-hmm. in the interview because I think it's a very crucial crucial question for what's happening right now with the Trump administration. But before we get there, you know, you say in your book that the Richard Nixon years are sort of a crucial turning point for the modern exercise of executive pri- privilege. Can you sort of walk us through uh, that? What What are the key sort of takeaways from the the Nixon era, the Watergate era? Give us some of the history um, and just tell us, you know, what did the Nixon era sort of resolve about executive privilege? So most Americans had never heard of executive privilege prior to the Nixon administration. And of course, executive privilege was a major basis for the constitutional battle between the president and the special counsel, independent counsel at that time, uh, Leon Jaworski, over access to summaries of the White House tapes uh, you know, that were being demanded as part of the investigation into the Watergate scandal. And so the president had claimed that 
the power of executive privilege gave him an absolute right to withhold the White House tapes or the summaries of the White House tapes and that no one else could have access to them because it might in some way uh, threaten the national security, reveal national secrets, compromise the national interest. So when the case goes to the Supreme Court of the United States and the Supreme Court in a unanimous decision rejects Mr. Nixon's claim of executive privilege in this case, saying that in the balancing test in our constitutional system, the need for information in a criminal investigation has to outweigh uh, the president's claimed need for secrecy. Now, what's important in the Nixon case is that the Supreme Court validated the legitimacy of executive privilege as a constitutional-based power. They simply rejected Nixon's particular invocation of that power. And so the Nixon case for the Supreme Court, the very first time, establishes the legitimacy of the existence of this power called executive privilege. Uh, Even at one point, the majority decision says that this power, I'm paraphrasing, is so obvious as to not require further discussion. Uh, But importantly, the court made it clear that in our system of separated powers, there has to be a balancing test of interests, right? So it is impossible to get the information that is needed in a criminal investigation to find out whether allegations of wrongdoing can be substantiated without getting access to particular documents, or in this case, the summaries of the White House tapes. So the Supreme Court simply said that Mr. Nixon's claim could not stand under those particular circumstances. What's ironic is that Mr. Nixon had, upon taking the presidency in 1969, issued an internal memorandum outlining the administration's formal policies for the exercise of executive privilege. And it actually is a very good document that explains that Um, The presumption is in favor of openness and transparency and that executive privilege should be used only rarely under the most compelling circumstances, um, such as national security needs. So ultimately, of course, Mr. Nixon ended up making a much more broad-based claim of the power of executive privilege, even to the point where his attorney, James St. Clair, in arguing before the Supreme Court, actually said that The executive branch was putting this matter before the court for its opinion as to what the law means in this area, but that the president under Article 2 is in control of his own constitutional powers and he will decide. Of course, the Supreme Court judges didn't like that um, because that was essentially saying that the court had no authority to determine what the law or what the Constitution requires in this particular circumstance. So that, obviously, in the Nixon case was a criminal matter. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the the sort of Congress, you know, issuing subpoenas and demanding information from the executive branch. How should we look at that sort of different kind of circumstance based on what we know um, about sort of the history of executive privilege and, and the case law as well? Right. So Congress's power to investigate is clearly established in constitutional law. And at times, Presidential administrations, when making claims of executive privilege in response to congressional demands for information and subpoenas, for example, have taken the position that Congress's power to investigate is not as compelling as its authority to legislate and that Congress has a less compelling need for information from the executive branch in cases of investigation as opposed to in cases of legislation. I find that to be a completely bogus argument. It is clearly established in our constitutional law historical practice that Congress has a very broad-based authority to conduct investigations and seek access to information from the executive branch, whether it is seeking information for the purpose of legislation or for the purpose of conducting investigations. And I would even go farther and say in the case of investigations, which by definition usually involve some allegation of wrongdoing, it may be even more compelling that Congress needs access to information. Otherwise, we don't get to find out uh, exactly what happened, and we don't get to hold the executive accountable if wrongdoing has taken place there. 
Right. So it's it's sort of interesting. I mean, unless the Congress gets the information, it's hard to know if if anything has gone wrong. So uh, or any crimes are being committed. And so it is um, it, it is a bit of a head scratcher to say, well, you know, that that power just sort of doesn't exist or isn't a real thing um, unless exactly. you have, you know, solid proof of it or something that that seems untenable. Right. Exactly right. And I think the mistake that presidential administrations make when they take this absolutist stand that Congress simply cannot have access to the information because it has a less compelling interest in uh, its role in investigations than in legislation, they're really making an untenable argument to begin with. But the administration, in the case of these circumstances, would do much better to engage in a negotiation process with Congress over access to information in which they reach some kind of reasonable compromise that protects the security interests of the executive branch that it's claiming it needs to protect while at the same time giving access to Congress members and staff perhaps to information that they need in order to determine whether Congress needs to dig deeper or there's really nothing there. So I, in my studies of executive privilege in these battles you know, going back in history, it is absolutely clear that administrations do far better when they engage in a good faith negotiation process than when they try to wall Congress off completely from access to information because it just leads to an escalation uh, between the two branches and the outcomes rarely are good for either. Well, so walk us through a little bit of the post-Watergate, post-Nixon era. Mm -hmm. How did, what what do you see of the key moments from some of those presidents exempting out the current president? We'll talk about that a little later. Sure. So, Nixon gave executive privilege a bad name. He made a claim to the president's right to exercise his power for the purpose of concealing his own wrongdoing in the Watergate cover-up. And so the common reaction to that was that executive privilege is a, ve- is a vehicle for presidents to withhold embarrassing or damaging information. And therefore, presidents succeeding Mr. Nixon – were very reluctant to utter the words executive privilege. I looked at White House documents from several administrations post-Watergate scandal to review what were the strategies of presidential administrations with regard to withholding information from Congress. And literally, in many cases, attorneys general and and, um, White House counsels advise presidents, don't use the phrase executive privilege because it's reminiscent of Nixon-era scandals and the public reaction and political fallout from that will be too damaging. And so we had what I argued was the very unfortunate circumstance of presidential administrations exercising forms of executive privilege without calling it that and coming up with other phrases or justifications for withholding information without really putting out there directly an executive privilege claim, which under The circumstances of many cases that I looked at really should have been done. I understand politically why that was done, but I think much damage was done to the principle of executive privilege. Executive privilege started to come back, particularly in the former Bill Clinton administration, where uh, the president actually showed little reluctance to claim executive privilege in a number of circumstances uh, and actually – had publicly stated that he thought it was important to reestablish uh, the legitimacy of the principle of executive privilege as a necessary presidential power. And I should clarify for our, our listeners, Mark has an excellent book uh, that I recommend to everyone. I've read it, I think, three times at this point. It's called Executive Privilege, Presidential Power, Secrecy, and Accountability. It's actually in its third edition. Uh, it was first published in 1994. I believe. That, that's correct. So excellent book. Um, and this is where Mark gets his just really deep, deep knowledge um, and history uh, of all of this. So let's move, I guess, to the the current the current times. Um, mm-hmm. So we've kind of laid a foundation. Uh, what do you when you look at what is going on with the Trump administration? You know, you have the president saying we're going to fight all the subpoenas. Um, you're seeing various um, tactics and techniques for, you know, either ignoring or being unresponsive or just outright saying no to various 
requests coming from Congress, um, even in the form of subpoenas, even issuing contempt citations um, mm-hmm. from the House. So how do you how do you see this current era? Uh, what, and, and maybe another way to ask that is what's going to be when you redo your book, the uh-huh. next the next edition, <laughs> what, what does the Trump chapter look like? Right. So I'm working on that now. There will be a new book or a new edition with a Trump chapter. We're not in a good situation right now. Uh, everybody knows that between the president and the Congress, there's a, there's a lack of comity and cooperation and an escalation of conflict between the branches, uh, a taking of absolute stands and refusal to back away from them and to compromise. And executive privilege very much falls within this entire framework of political polarization and the branches simply not working well together. Uh, in the current era. And the Trump administration is no exception, although I will argue it is not unique. We can go back, for example, to the former George W. Bush administration and find many cases where the presidential administration took the tack of escalating the conflict rather than engaging in negotiations over access to information and were willing to let the matter go before the courts and drag it out over long periods of time. Uh, We had the same thing with the Fast and Furious investigation in the Obama administration as well. Uh, The Trump administration has taken it, I think, somewhat to a different or higher level of conflict uh, where the president has refused, for example, to allow private citizen Don McGahn to appear before a congressional committee to talk about, you know, that the uh, former White House counsel, the uh, Mueller report and the um, Russia investigation of what he knew and did not know. So the um, the Trump administration has taken some of these conflicts to the next level in fighting back against subpoenas, refusing, for example, to allow former White House counsel, now private citizen Don McGahn, to appear before Congress to talk about what he knew regarding the Russia investigation and details in the Mueller report. And the Trump administration, interesting, has asserted a new language regarding executive privilege, what they call a protective executive privilege that they've now used at least on two occasions to refuse to allow Congress to get access to information, either uh, White House documents or testimony by White House officials or former White House officials. And as I understand it, this concept of protective executive privilege means simply that the administration will not allow information to go before Congress if that information might at some point be subject to a future claim of executive privilege. So, for example, Jeff Sessions, the, and then the attorney general, is appearing before legislative committee, um, Senate Intelligence Committee, right? And he's being asked a number of questions that he refuses to answer based on, he said, on protecting the president's right in the future to claim executive privilege over that. And the senators are asking him, well, you're refusing to answer questions what's your legal basis for refusing to do so? What's the legal principle? And he says, I'm protecting the president's right to claim executive privilege because he might do so in the future. Well, it's amazing. They're having it both ways, right? Because the president has made no formal claim of executive privilege. He therefore claims he's been completely open and transparent and cooperative and never claimed executive privilege. But his attorney general is telling the Senate committee, I can't answer your questions because something might be protected by executive privilege in the future. So yeah. even a broadening out of this idea, uh, casting sort of a broader net of ways to protect information. Well, that's exactly right. So I, I will say, by the way, the protective executive privilege that Trump is claiming actually has a precedent from the former Bill Clinton administration. So in my review of White House documents, I saw that they had a category of documents that were, quote unquote, subject to executive privilege. And this is actually quite similar to the Trump administration's assertion of a protective executive privilege. So in the former Clinton administration, the documents that were under protection under this concept of subject to executive privilege were withheld because they might at some point in the future lead to a claim of executive privilege by the president. So the Trump administration actually cited the former Clinton administration and a, uh, a, a document from the uh, Attorney General Janet Reno uh, on this particular point. 
And I, and I make the case in my writings on this and, and will in the next edition of the book that this is the problem when presidents establish a bad precedent, when they try to be clever and work around the constraints built into the system of separated powers by claiming new and broader principles of protection against the legislative branch getting access to information. And then this becomes documented, it becomes established, and then it becomes a basis for a future administration to claim uh, that there's a precedent and they can do this too. And then it just keeps escalating. Right. Yeah, it seems uh, the protective executive privilege, I, I, I think you're exactly right. It's had this sort of seeds in prior administration and is now, it's sort of metastasized almost in this administration by just being used and exploited to to shield uh, more information, it seems. Um, but can we talk a little bit about Don McGahn? Because I want to get your view. Obviously, he is a was a close White House mm-hmm. advisor, White House counsel, arguably the the case for executive privilege is strongest with someone like him. Um, what, what's your sort of view of Don McGahn and, and how what's the right way for that to play out in your view? He should testify and he should just cooperate with Congress and testify. That's that's my view. He's a private citizen. The presumed protection uh, that belongs to a government official while in office uh, becomes less substantial after that person has left government. Um, in this particular case, there are serious allegations of wrongdoing. Presumably, he would have direct knowledge of events that transpired and other information uh, that are very germane to this investigation. And over the course of the history of executive privilege, and this has been established in the Nixon case, the SB case, and other foundational cases in constitutional law and executive privilege, in cases of wrongdoing or serious allegations of wrongdoing, the presumption in favor of secrecy very substantially weakens. Again, the balancing test. And in this particular case, I don't see any basis for preventing McGahn from providing testimony. Now, there's another important point, by the way. When the president tries to stop someone from his administration or formally from his administration from testifying on the basis that the executive privilege protects the president's right to confidentiality about certain types of information, that doesn't mean that person cannot testify at all. It is absolutely legitimate for a high-level White House staffer, personal advisor to the president, for example, and there's precedent for this, to testify before Congress, but in the course of testimony, not to answer some questions that may pertain to uh, legitimate executive privilege claims, while being available there to answer all other questions about which executive privilege has no, you know, no basis at all. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be an either or that the president completely walls off from testimony an official because some question that pertains to executive privilege may come up or the person comes and tells everything. It can be something in between. And again, this could be part of a good faith negotiation process that takes place uh, between the White House and the congressional committee over what's appropriate in the testimony, you know, and uh, and, and what's not going to be answered uh, because executive privilege applies. Nice. I guess we'll see how that unfolds. Uh, Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Jerry Nadler, said that he was going to pursue uh, that the uh, enforcement of that subpoena for Don McGahn to appear before the committee. So maybe in the next, if that prevails, then maybe in the next phase, we'll see that type of negotiation go on. I want to just ask you, about a particular phrase, phraseology that the Trump administration has been using. Uh, in particular, there's several court actions going on. Um, so this phrase that the, the Trump administration is using in a number of the court proceedings, but also in discussions with congressional players, um, they're saying that the particular request lacks a legitimate legislative purpose. Mm. Uh, and, you know, to me, that says the the 
administration isn't even talking yet about executive privilege. They're, they're going back a step further and saying, no, you, the Congress, you don't even have the power to sort of ask for this stuff. It's not, you know, instead of saying, OK, this is a legitimate request from the Congress, but there's this competing, countervailing interest of executive privilege. It's almost like they're trying to cut out the, the more basic uh, notion that Congress has the right to ask for this information. Is that a nomenclature issue or do you see a more substantive, you know, issue problem going on there? Oh, I think it's a much more substantive issue because that is a direct attack on the legitimacy of Congress and its position in our system of separated powers. It is emphatically not the province of the executive branch to tell Congress what its legislative purpose is. That's written into the Constitution, and it's quite clear. So if the administration is trying to protect information from disclosure on the basis that Congress simply has no right to be peering into the executive branch because it doesn't serve a legislative purpose. I find no basis, no valid basis for that argument at all. And this is this is the problem that's going on with the Trump administration right now. They have made a number of claims, uh, not only of executive privilege, but some common law privileges, which probably should have been called executive privilege. Uh, as vehicles for withholding information, and they have attacked Congress's investigatory authority. In one case, refused to provide information and then demanded to know what was Congress's regulatory interest in the matter, you know, and asking what is Congress's legislative interest in the case that you're pointing out. I just find that quite astonishing that the executive branch would be asking Congress whether Congress has any right to be performing its basic constitutional functions under Article One of the Constitution. It's 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 quite amazing. Yeah, and you talked earlier about there's sort of presumption in favor of openness, sort of presumption in favor of the Congress getting the information. It seems to me, and tell me if you think I'm right or wrong, the Trump administration has almost sort of flipped that presumption and said, no, the presumption is we yes. hold it back. Um, and you either have to go to court or, you know, just get a tiny little bit through neg negotiations in order to get anything. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, you're right about that. Um, so it's in the executive branch, of course, and you can understand why sometimes this is done. And this happened a number of times in the former George W. Bush administration to make the argument that Congress has to prove it needs access to information. Otherwise, the executive has no necessity to turn over whatever Congress wants. Um, but court decisions and historic precedent have established very clearly Congress's right to investigate is as powerful as its um, authority to legislate. Congress needs access to information to do its job. And again, the presumption in our system, you know, a Democratic Republic is in favor of openness of information. It's, in, it's incumbent on the president to prove that secrecy is necessary. Uh, in order to withhold information. It's not incumbent upon Congress to prove that it has the right to investigate. So you know, I, I have to ask you about impeachment mm -hmm. because there's a lot of frustrated people out there saying, gee, you know, the House Democrats are not able to get anything from the Trump administration. The Trump is just holding everything back. Some people say, well, the way to cure that is to open an impeachment proceeding that will sort of op open up the doors and and, and things we better. I mean, do, do you think that's true? Molly Reynolds, my colleague, and I wrote a paper a few uh, months ago about how a lot of the investigative powers and subpoena power have already been devolved to the committees. Mm -hmm. um, but what's your what's your view? Will impeachment, you know, really change the situation or, or not? It's really hard to say uh, at this point. Democratic Party members of the House are quite divided as to whether impeachment is the way to go. The House Speaker doesn't think the timing is right uh, to do so, but that may be more for political reasons than constitutional-based ones. So as you know, there are many members of the House who believe that the president may indeed have committed impeachable offenses but are hesitant to go forward simply because they know what ultimately will happen in the Senate, given the partisan equation there. And so they don't want to give a, you know, a political victory in a, in a sense to the president that um, impeachment articles ultimately were rejected and the president was, quote unquote, acquitted. So issues of impeachment, much like many of the issues of executive privilege we've been talking about, come down to politics oftentimes, not just strictly speaking constitutional standards. 
You know, from my academic standpoint, I could certainly argue very easily that the House should ignore the partisan equation and do what it thinks is constitutionally right. And if the evidence suggests that the president has committed impeachable offenses, that they should conduct their hearings and do a thorough investigation and let the chips where they fall where they may and just do their jobs and vote, right? But that's easier said from the outside than than from the inside, of course. But, you know, Congress has many other tools it can use at its disposal to try to force the president's hand in a number of areas, right, particularly with regard to these executive privilege battles. So the president refused to provide documents from Brett Kavanaugh's former service in the Justice Department and in the the George W. Bush White House uh, when the Senate was doing its hearings and review of a candidate for the Supreme Court. And so the Senate could have just said, no documents, no information, no vote on your nominee. We'll wait. And that's been done before. And it's been done successfully in the Reagan years and the Nixon years. In the case of the Reagan administration, it was a Republican majority Senate committee that said no documents on Rehnquist and his past service in the Nixon administration. Um, Then no vote on your nominee. And the president caved. So What I lament more than anything else on this topic is the lack of institutional interest by many members, regardless of their partisan affiliation. Members should be standing up for the institutional prerogatives of Congress because it's important. It matters to the future. What they do now establishes precedents and makes it easier for future presidents, including ones that they don't like, to claim certain powers over Congress and to be able to avoid accountability and to push back against the normal system of separated powers that's intended to keep presidents accountable. And so I find it extremely unfortunate that we're in this situation where we're talking about whether impeachment should go forward based on how the votes may line up because of the partisan equation. But that's just the fact. I agree with you on that. Um, Thank you so much, Mark, for coming in and talking with us. Thank you, Margaret. I, I appreciate it. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Thanks this week to Mark Rizel for coming on the show. Please share the Lawfare Podcast and give us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. The podcast is edited by Jen Pacha Howell, and your audio engineer this week is Vishnu Kanun. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening. powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hey, this is Jane Uger, host of the Young Turks, part of TYT's podcast network. We're the world's most popular progressive news show online. Not a big deal, I'm just saying. And we deliver an uncensored, unapologetic version of the news you won't get anywhere else. And that's really true. You should definitely check it out. So listen to the Young Turks on the Acast app or wherever you get your podcasts. A cash recommends. recommends.